So what's up everybody? My name is Austin Moore. If this is your first time watching, this is the Run Good Play Better Poker Series. And you know, I like to keep a personal aspect of my life in each of these vlogs going forward. So today I'm going to show you guys just kind of my drive to the library. That's where I do all of my poker editing. Uh, when I was in college, I got tons of work done over there. It's peaceful, it's quiet, and there's not really a ton of distractions. So it's a really good place, you know, just to get any work done if you go to your local library. Um, during, for this session, before it actually took place, I was at the library editing content. And I posted an Instagram story. My boy Mikey calls me. He's like, bro, why are you editing? You know, you need to come over here and make some content with me. So I packed all my stuff up. I headed over to the lake and had just a killer session. It was a lot of fun, you know, making jokes with my boy. And, you know, it was very profitable at the end. So I'm actually going to show a little little clip of Mikey, you know, doing some table talk with me before the session starts. And I hope you guys like the content. Let's go. I'm nervous. <laughs> All right, everybody. So in the first hand of this episode, the hijack player opens to $14. The button makes the call. And I look down at pocket tens in the small blind. I'm definitely going to be raising here. Don't necessarily want to play this hand out of position. I make it $38 to go. And the player in the hijack position is a little antsy. She taps on the table to get the big blind player to fold her call. And she ends up making the call here, and I think this influences the player on the button to also go ahead and make the call. So we're now headed three ways to the flop out of position with a pot over $100. The flop comes out, and it's jack high with a 9 and a 7 of diamonds. So I don't have top pair at this point, but I do have a gut shot and backdoor diamonds to even a straight flush. So I think this is going to be a good time for me to bet here. If someone has a jack, they'll definitely let me know by raising or just calling at this point. So I make it $66 to go. And I think this is a good size bet here. It's about half the pot. It gives anybody with the flush draw roughly a 3 to 1 to call. A little bit less than that. So technically it's a bad call for anyone with the flush draw. Unless they really expect to get paid out by me once they hit it. So I'm really hoping that nobody does have a jack here. And it doesn't really seem like the player in the hijack position has a jack. She takes a little bit of time before ending up making the call here. Which makes me think that she's kind of plotting something. Maybe she's just putting me on ace king and she has a lower pocket pair. Or maybe just a nine or a seven here. The player on the button goes ahead and folds here. And the Queen of Diamonds comes out on the turn. I don't really love this card because the flush does get there. Hands like King-10 or maybe King-Queen that were just a non-believer are going to get there. So I go ahead and check. The hijack checks it back to me. And the Four of Hearts comes out on the river. I still really just want to see a showdown at this point. I don't want to put any more money in the pot when I could be very behind. So I go ahead and check over to her. And I think given the fact that I checked on both the turn and the river now, she thinks that I'm holding something very weak, like maybe ace-king, no pair. Maybe even a hand like ace-ten with just the ace of diamonds. Uh, wouldn't really make sense though, because I probably would have bet out on the turn at that point. But the hijack player ends up putting down a bet of $75. I go ahead and check my hand now at this point to see that I do actually have the ten of diamonds. I think it's a pretty important card at this point because a lot of the hands that somebody would be raising pre-flop for $14 and then calling the flop with would contain a 10 of diamonds. So the stronger hands that she's really going to have here like king, king 10 of diamonds or maybe jack 10 of diamonds that she could call such a large bet on the flop with, she's really not able to actually have. 
So it makes me really wonder if she does have a hand like king queen. Maybe she luckily has the other 10 for a king 10 in this hand. But none of it really makes sense to me. So while I'm thinking over the hand, the player in the hijack starts a little bit of table talk. She kind of tries to push the hand along and get me to make a decision already, which really influences my call at this point. So I'll play the table talk for you and then show what I actually end up doing here. Do you have the jack? Is that why you're struggling here? Don't have a jack. Oh, okay. Ace King, no good. No. Is the jack good? I just thought that's why you were struggling because you were hit the jack. You saw the diamonds come to the jack. Let's move along. I'm old. Mm. Interesting. I just want to see it. So I go ahead and make the call after hearing what my opponent has to say at the table. It's really always a sign of weakness when people try and move the hand along. It just shows that their nerves are high and they just want to get their bluff over with already. So I go ahead and put the chips in. My opponent shows nine deuce of hearts for a pair of nines. So I'm going to make a $220 profit during this hand and feel really good about my session going forward knowing that I made a pretty tough decision on a very wet board for a profitable call here. I think that if my opponent had decided to go all in here, it actually would have made the call a lot harder. But given the odds that I was given, about like four and a third to one to be right, I think that making this call is pretty standard. That being said, it, it won't be right every time, but in this exact situation and using my tells, it ended up being a very profitable call. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, my boy Mikey hit me up. He was playing and saw my story on Instagram about editing and said to come through and get some content instead of editing it. So I get moved over to his game and in the very first hand at this table, I wake up with Queen 10 offsuit and the big blind. So there's a raise from the under the gun player to $10. The action folds all the way back around to me who decides to make the call here. And we go to a flop which comes 6, 5, 10, rainbow. I flop top pair, pretty good hand. My opponent, after I check over to him, bets $15. I'm just gonna make the call here. We go to a nine of hearts on the turn. I think it's a good spot to check and let him keep betting, but he ends up just checking himself. And the four diamonds comes out on the river. I want to bet just as a blocker in case he has an overpair or wants to try and bluff for a big bet. This doesn't work though. My opponent has pocket kings and snap calls. So I'm going to lose $40 in the first hand at this new table. Not a huge loss, but it does hurt a little bit. So in this next hand, I look down at pocket queens under the gun. I make a raise to $15, and I don't think anyone really believes that I have a strong hand at this point. I just had pocket queens in a previous hand where I got all in for a pretty small pot, and it definitely seems like the case that no one's putting me on a strong hand because everyone and their mom decides to make the call here, even though under the gun raises are typically viewed as a very strong hand. And we're now going to head six ways to a flop. The flop comes out and it's pretty good for me. It comes 933 rainbow. And I think I'm most likely going to have the best hands here unless somebody did, you know, call my bet with a three in their hands, which if they did, they're a jerk. But I think it's a good time for me to bet. I make a bet of $62 here. It's a good size bet that if somebody does have a three, I think they would probably shove knowing that I'm going to have either an overpair or a bluff at this point. So I think it's a good bet to kind of give me information on where I'm at in the hands. And the cutoff player takes his time after everyone falls to him and just makes a call here. He looked at his cards and seemed a little bit unsure. And now he's actually pulling out his phone, so he really doesn't seem too interested in the hands. He probably is going to have a smaller pocket pair like sixes, sevens, or eights. 
maybe a hand like ace nine or maybe even a hand like pocket tens or jacks at this point so when the four of diamonds comes out on the turn there's now a flush draw I'm not really putting him on that flush draw, but I want to try and make it look like I'm bluffing at this point with another large size bet. So I make it $120 to go, and this works out pretty well for me. The player in the cutoff just decides to move all in at this point for $195 effective. I don't take very long at all. I go ahead and call the extra 75, and the 10 of diamonds comes out on the river. I am pretty much positive that my hand's best so i just go ahead and show the pocket queens my opponent folds right away and we're going to take down a 337 dollar profit in this hand so yet again i make the mistake of showing my hand before my opponent my opponent went all in here so technically he does have to show his cards before i do since i made the call but i got a little bit excited and wanted to show my strong hands here and felt like I was good regardless, but that's really just something I'm going to have to work on to get a little bit more intel on how other people are playing this game against me. In this next hand, I look down at queen 10 suited and middle position plus one. There's a limper from the middle position player who happens to be my boy Mikey. I let him know it's not a good idea to limp by raising here. And the player in the button and the player in the big blind and Mikey all end up making the call here. So we're going to head four ways to a flop, which comes queen, eight, three, rainbow. And action checks over to me. I flop top pair. I have a decent kicker. So I'm going to throw out a bet here of $30. And just the player on the button makes the call. And Mikey in the middle position goes ahead and makes a raise. And he makes it $130 to go at this point. It's a pretty large size bet, and I think that there's not really going to be too many drawing hands on this board that would feel comfortable making this bet. So I'm really putting him on a stronger hand, like maybe pocket threes, maybe pocket eights, or maybe even queen eight at this point. I don't think that my hand is good, but I do want to know what he had. So when I fold my cards, I try and hold on to them to let him know that I did fold a queen in case he was bluffing. He showed a bluff in the previous hand that he played, so I am kind of worried that he might be bluffing me off of a hand here, but at the same time, it's really not a hand that I should be calling. If there was maybe a 9 or a 3 of hearts instead of the 3 of diamonds on the board, it would make it a little bit easier for me to peel at least one time. But I go ahead and fold the player on the button calls. She ended up showing that she had a gut shot straight draw, but it was a very short stack. So figured maybe it was a good time for her to double up. And Mikey actually goes ahead and shows queen eight offsuit for a flopped two pair. It was a good fold on my part. It's a little bit annoying that Mikey got there after limping in, but that's just poker. Let's move on to the next hand. So this next hand is where the action starts to pick up a little bit. I have over double the starting stack, so I want to start straddling here to make the pots bigger. I go ahead and do that, and the player on the button and the small blind both limp in. I look down at ace-10 offsuit and make a raise to $21. I more than likely have the best hand at this point, and we go three ways to a flop. The flop comes out. It comes king high with a 10 and a 4 rainbow. And action checks around here, I don't really want to put a bet out in case someone is trapping with the king. But once everybody does check around, the five of spades comes out on the turn. And I want to try and start getting some value for my hand, so I make a bet of $20. Just the player on the button goes ahead and makes the call, and the player in the small blind just folds here. We go to a river now, which comes an offsuit two. There is no flush draw on the board, and I... I kind of feel like my hand is good, but want to make sure that I'm not getting trapped by a king still. So I check it over to the player on the button to keep his bluffs alive. And he puts out a bet of $75. This reminds me a little bit of the first hand in the session where I checked a couple times on the board and someone tried to steal a pot with a worse hand. And it really puts me into the tank for quite a while. I think realistically, if my opponent had a king on the button, he would have definitely bet the flop and or raised the turn. 
There was really a lot of draws on the turn that came through, such as Queen Jack or any spade draw, or you know even a hand like uh, six seven. They all are going to be hands that want to bet at this point when the action checks through on the flop. So I'm a little bit confused on my opponent's action at this point. I think that he could just be trying to steal the pot with a worse 10. And it, there's really so many bluffs on this board that would end up missing that I think it's a good time to call here. Really the only hand that does get there is going to be a hand like 6-3, which if he's calling that hand for $20 in this game, it's possible being on the button, but it's really not a great call to be making. So given the situation, I think that I'm going to just have to put the money in the pot at this point. I'm getting a little bit over 2-1 to one to call, which means I only have to be right half of the time. And it turns out that I am wrong in this situation. My opponent does show the 6-3. He actually had 6-3 of spades for a turned flush draw and open-ended straight draw, which makes me very surprised that he didn't raise here. And makes me think that he's really going to be a tighter player, which means that it's going to be difficult to get my money back from this guy. But I'm definitely going to try because I need some revenge after this guy getting so lucky on the river and making me lose $116 in this pot. So I'm looking out for some revenge and not even two hands after the last hand with ace-10 offsuit. I get the opportunity when I see the player in middle position raised to $17. This is the same guy that just had 6-3 of spades against me. And now I'm in the small blind with 6-4 of spades. So when I see the player in the hijack make the call, I am definitely getting in here with this hand. I go ahead and call, and the player under the gun also goes ahead and makes the call. So if you guys can say run good on the count of three as we wait for the flop to come out. One, two, three. Run good, baby. 4-4 four, four deuces the flop. There's two clubs, and I'm going to go ahead and check my hand to try and lay a trap for the middle position player. I think he's definitely going to have an overpair or an ace-king kind of a hand here. And it definitely looks this way when he puts out a bet of $60. The player in the hijack looks like he's ready to gamble. He goes ahead and calls the $60, and it really leads me to believe that he has a flush draw or some kind of an open-ended straight draw, and I want to make him pay for this. So I put out a bet of $160. I think that I could also be making this move with a larger pocket pair than the board, but really not that large, such as 6s, 7s, 8s, or 9s. And the opponent in the middle position, who is the opponent from the last hand, does not seem to like this very much. He's getting a great price to call with any kind of a hand. Even if he had just ace-king of clubs, he could definitely make the call here. But I really don't think he has ace-king of clubs here. I think he's going to have a hand like pocket queens, pocket kings, or potentially even aces. Especially when he goes ahead and makes the call. Then the player in the hijack moves all in for $182 effective. It's not much more at all. So we're just going to call here can't raise and the player in the middle position also goes ahead and makes the call so even if the player in the hijack position has a larger four than me the player in middle position has about two hundred dollars left in his stack so i can still end this hand with a slight profit if i am losing to the player in hijack position i'm really not worried about this though when the six of hearts comes out on the turn there's $600 in the pot, and I don't think my opponent in middle position is willing to fold here, so I just move all in. I have him covered. He has about $215 left in his stack, and he's getting about 4 to 1 on the call here with any hand. So I think it's likely that I could be bluffing here with some kind of a club draw. I think this is what he thinks when he makes the call. The three of clubs comes out on the turn. My opponent shows pocket kings, and I flip over the six four of spades for a turned boat. And the player in the hijack position, he's looking at his cards very sad because he actually had three four for a rivered boat, which was smaller than mine. I'm going to stack both of them, and it feels magical given that I was pretty upset at the opponent from the last hand after getting there on the river with me. So I'm going to make a profit of $635 here and take down some sweet, sweet revenge. So for the final interesting hand of this session, I look down at pocket aces in middle position. Let's just talk about running hot for a second. It feels amazing. 
and it really feels great when the player in the cutoff position decides to raise my bet to $45. I love this so much, and it gets a little bit strange to me when the player on the button decides to cold call here for $45. This makes my decision a little bit difficult of whether I want to try and trap or if I want to make a raise to commit stacks at this point. But the player on the cutoff actually makes my decision very easy when he says this to me. Do it. So although he sounds like Darth Sidious in the third Star Wars movie, I respond kindly to his request by making a raise to $115. He loves it and decides to go all in himself. This move actually goes ahead and pushes out the player on the button who cold called. I think he definitely had some kind of a pocket pair here. Uh, definitely not putting either player on ace king given that I have two aces in my hand. But my opponent in the cutoff position actually shows ace king which makes me feel great. The flop comes out 3-8-10. The turn is a 9 and the river is a 5. My opponent does not even come close to catching up to me. And I'm going to take down another sweet pot before I get out of here. I think that with my bet sizing of $115 on the raise, if the player in the cutoff position did just decide to call here, the player on the button would have also been able to call. But it ends up being a very good thing that my opponent and the cutoff position went all in because the player on the button says that he folded pocket eights and would have flopped a set. If this opponent had decided to stay in the pot, it would have been an absolute disaster for me, but luckily the player in the cutoff went all in. I kind of expected him to do such a thing when he said, do it, and it ended up working out for me great. So I take down a profit of $295 in this hand before deciding to rack up and secure my win for the day. So whether you just like to have fun at the poker tables or you're one of those hardcore grinders, I think it's a really important note to make that you should always try and make friends at the table. You know, don't play easy against them, but have people that you can talk to about hands and different situations. One of the friends I've made is my boy Manny, so go ahead and say what's up to him now. Yes, sir. <laughs> He's about to run it up just like I do. Hell yeah, and I'm about to like you. <laughs> no, you're going to do more, right? Yeah, more, more, do yeah, more. Yeah. So what's up everybody, uh, finally made it to the library here, uh, about to go in there and just edit all this content for you guys, put it all together, get some final cuts in there, excited. Uh, so I mean, like I said, it was a crazy session, uh, total profit on the day was $1,330, played probably like roughly 6 hours, so like, you know, ROI is real good there. <laughs> um, luckily my boy Mikey called me and told me to come through, it was an epic session. Um, you know, the pocket 10 hand in the beginning, I really, really just didn't believe that I was beat at that point. It really just felt so fishy and suspicious. So I stuck the money in, made the call, and I ended up being right. Then, you know, a little while later, I had the ace 10 offsuit hands. And I think when I was in that hand, I was kind of just thinking back to the pocket 10s. I felt like I was good again. I definitely wasn't. My opponent showed basically the nuts, and I got wrecked. <laughs> Luckily though, I mean it kind of inspired me to really chase after that guy in the next hand where I had the 6-4 suited I flopped trips turned a bow and really just got maximum value from him and the other opponent in the hands and Turned up a nice profit for the day. So I hope you guys are liking these videos I hope you like the personal aspect and I hope you guys like and subscribe stay tuned for the next one